You have my book in the background. Is that a blue thing? I have it. Yes, yeah. It's oh, here, much right? of the challenge. Oh, yes. that's so funny. <laughs> Yes. That's nice. Very clever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I got your contact from Piers Ubersha. Of course, he's a good friend yeah. of mine. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, your number from him. So, so um, do you cover um, all of South Asia or? Um, actually, um, uh, I'm with Afghan service. Uh -huh. And we broadcast to Afghanistan and the Park, uh, uh, Park Afghan region border. Yeah, okay. Pass. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. So today, um, the Afghan Taliban, they attacked the UN compound uh, in Herat. So it's, you know, things are, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. So I'm going to start now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Christine, uh, for your time. And uh, let me start from today's major news. Uh, today, uh, the Afghan Taliban attacked the UN com uh, compound in, uh, the, uh, in Herat province of Afghanistan. Uh, the UN has condemned the attack. And also today, the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan, they accused a uh, Taliban of uh, killing civilians. Um, and uh, Christine, if we see all this is happening after Taliban's control um, over a good number of districts in uh, Afghanistan. So uh, what do you think where this situation uh, goes from here? I'm really I mean, I'm just so frustrated with the United States government. Um, the United States government has been saying for how many years now, first under, well, actually it began under Obama, then Trump, and now with Biden, that the Taliban are negotiating some kind of a settlement. And that just hasn't been the case. The Taliban have not been negotiating. The Taliban have not kept a single promise. And the fact of the matter is, um, the United States has done very little to prevent the Taliban from continuing um, to take ever more hold of Afghanistan because it hasn't done anything about Pakistan. You know, it is for the last 20 years, it has known to varying degrees that the Pakistanis are completely behind the Taliban. And yet the US government treats Pakistan like an ally. So I have to say, I don't even know what to tell people anymore because American behavior is simply so disgraceful. It's not like people didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, you know, I I expect that Afghanistan is going to have some really horrific struggles ahead because the U.S. government has done everything it can to disempower Ghani, enabling the Taliban to have pretty much free reign over Afghanistan. Uh, it's just, as an American, uh, there's uh, the only word that comes to mind is bias de charmindigi. It's just a disgrace. Hmm. I'll come back to Pakistan topic. Uh, you know, there is a lot that I would like to take your uh, views on that. But uh, uh, let's come to the attack first, um, uh, talk about it first. Attack on UN compound. Uh, it's something against the international law. So uh, what do you think, in what capacity you think the international community, including U.S., should respond to this attack? I mean, so so I think you know, you know, I used to work for the United Nations, and I've spent um, over many years, I've been to that office quite a bit. And uh, until the pandemic began, you know, I used to go to Herat every year. So, um I've I've had a, a I don't know an enduring relationship with Herat. So I mean this is all really I mean it's just I don't I'm I'm at a loss for words, but I also know that the United Nations cannot do anything about this. I know that the stomach for any kind of international action against the Taliban simply doesn't exist. And what I suspect is going to happen, um, well, it, I don't suspect, I know it has happened, 
because of the United States pullout from Afghanistan, all of our partners have also pulled out. So the Taliban don't have to negotiate because the Taliban have won. And I think what the Taliban see themselves as doing is simply uh, consolidating their control over the country. So I don't, I don't really think there's anything that can be done um, mm-hmm. because the international community won't do anything that's meaningful. Uh, Christine, what you have said right now, uh, this is what uh, the Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, uh, this uh, in this week uh, interviewed to a U.S. Uh, um, uh, news channel. He said exactly this, that uh, Taliban have won and they don't want to negotiate and they don't need to actually. So, uh, but Blinken uh, yesterday... But I do want to say this though, the, the, the problem that I have with Imran Khan is that he is a liar. Um, He wants to pretend as if Pakistan isn't behind this victory. But the fact of the matter is, without Pakistan, and it is unending sources of support, financial, military, diplomatic, political, the Taliban would be a nuisance. So, and it, what, what Imran Khan basically did is he is he is sharing in the victory of the Taliban. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the uh, Secretary Blinken, who returned to Washington uh, yesterday uh, after visiting India and Kuwait, uh, he says that Pakistan has a vital influence on Taliban and the U.S. wants Islamabad to play uh, the role in this uh, uh, peace talks to bring Taliban to the negotiation uh, table and ask them to stop this violence. You would say about this. So, you know, I can't. So I've been studying South Asia since 1991, right? I have literally lost track of all of the times that an American official has said this. So America It is all talk. It is no action. And there are so many things that the United States could do to Pakistan. Look at what the U.S. did to Iran, right? Iran's IGRC it has been declared to be a terrorist organization by the United States. Yet, in my view, and I think in the views of many Afghans, as well as Pashtuns in Pakistan, the ISI is even more dangerous than the IGRC. But yet, why doesn't the United States call the ISI what it is, a terrorist organization, right? We freeze the assets of Iranian officials. Why haven't we frozen the assets of Pakistani officials who have been unendingly and unceasingly and untiringly supporting the Taliban and the Haqqani network, right? Um, Hekmatyar, Lashkar Taiba, and so many other militant groups that Pakistan has long used. So Secretary Blinken can say whatever he wants, but the fact is he knows that this government, like all other governments before him, is not going to do anything to make Pakistan likely to do that. Um, What you said, uh, Christine, is uh, that the U.S., they couldn't take any action against Pakistan in these uh, past uh, 20 years. Well, it's not that they can't, they won't. They want. Okay. So I'm coming to that. Actually, uh, the analysts over here in Washington, D.C. and back in the region, they raised this question more than ever before that, look, we have seen Osama bin Laden was uh, killed in Pakistan. Um, the, uh, even uh, two Omar. weeks ago, yeah, Mullah Omar was killed there. Um, and uh, Sheikh Rashid, La, uh, two weeks ago, uh, he said that uh, all the leadership of Afghan Taliban, they are living uh, in Islamabad, right? So, Absolutely. And now, on social media, we are seeing that the dead bodies of terrorists, they are coming from uh, um, Afghanistan to Pakistan for burial. So uh, why the U.S., what analyst card, the Pakistani factor, they couldn't uh, tackle that in these uh, 20 years. What are the reasons? I wish I could tell you. I mean, I study this for a living. And, you know, and there was a time when I was asked to join the government. And I didn't, one of the reasons why I decided to not join the government was because I saw that the government was not willing to do what I thought needed to be done. And I didn't want to be a part of another government that facilitates Pakistani terrorism. I think what 
I, I know what Americans think. Um, Americans think that Pakistan is too hard. They think, so there's so many parts of this. So one, the Pakistanis have convinced Americans that they are too dangerous to fail. And that if you push them too hard, they'll fail. Then there are these different doomsday scenarios about Pakistan's nuclear weapons, about nuclear weapons falling into the hands of the bad guys. They're, I mean, basically the, the Pakistanis use their nuclear weapons to coerce the Americans into thinking Pakistan is too dangerous to fail. I, I, I actually think Pakistan won't fail if the United States does what it needs to do to change Pakistani behavior. But I've been, I've been advising this since 2004, if not earlier, that the United States has been completely wrong about Pakistan. So over 16 years, I've, I also have been saying this. Um, and it's kind of inexplicable um, why it is that Americans are so persuaded and it, I'll tell you also very bluntly, the Pakistanis have been running a very effective influence operations in the United States, right? Um, at think tanks, you know, at Stimson Center, for example, um, at the um, the Wilson Center, at the Middle East Institute, you'll find um, American citizens basically doing Pakistan's bidding, saying, uh, all sorts of absurd things about Pakistan's helpfulness in the war on terror. And the reason for that is they're not being paid by the Pakistani government. Um, the Pakistani government lures them in with uh, access. And if you criticize the Pakistani government, as I do, you don't get visas. And if you can't go to Pakistan, uh, people don't view you as a credible expert. So you have people like Michael Kugelman, who will never criticize the Pakistani government. He's constantly being quoted in American newspapers, um, but he is one of those people that has been co-opted by the Pakistanis, and he's not the only one. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum at the Middle East Institute, um, he will not host people at his institution or even invite them to events who are critical. And then obviously we had Moeed Yusuf, um, he co-opted the entire United States Institute of Peace. And I, I call it the U.S. Institute of Pakistan. And these individuals, they, they um, engage with the media, they give television interviews, they, um, newspaper uh, correspondents interview them. And so they're also part of the disinformation campaign. And Pakistan doesn't have to pay them a cent to do it. They do it because it's in their own interest to lie to the American public about Pakistan. OK, if we come to the peace talks process, uh, we see that uh, this process facing stalemate. So what do you think, uh, Christine, what should be done and uh, what leverage or leverages US can employ on Taliban uh, to stop violence and uh, ensure peace in uh, Afghanistan? See, here's the thing. I, I'm so cynical about American intentions that I don't think the Americans intend to do that at all. I think the Americans um, believe that this is Afghanistan's problem. And I think the Americans are really trying to absolve themselves of any responsibility. And they'll have various stories to justify this. But I think that's where the United States is. If the United States cared about this truly, let me put it to you this way. When we had the height of the surge, right, when there are about 350 international military forces and a, and a very large number of civilian aid workers in Afghanistan, when the Taliban were mostly targeting international actors and Americans in particular, the United States did nothing to curb Pakistan's support for the Taliban. It did nothing. So what do you think the US is going to do now that the Taliban are primarily targeting Afghans? Hmm. I mean, I'm I, as an American, I am, I am very ashamed of what my government has done. Um, and it's not just one government, you know, it, it began with George W. Bush and it continues under Biden. Hmm. 
Okay, so uh, recently the U.S. Uh, Central Command estimates that they have completed more than 95% of the whole uh, withdrawal process. Uh, but the Biden administration, uh, they said that they will continue their support uh, to Afghan government. But, uh, you know, not only Afghans, if we see uh, even others in the neighbor countries, they call it the repetition of uh, 1990s. Uh, you were yep. saying this. So I've been saying the same thing, right? Uh, the United States withdrew in 1990. Um, Charlie Wilson, who was the architect of the U.S. Uh, engagement with Pakistan, right? It, I mean, to be clear, Pakistan began jihad, if we're going to use that word, in 1974, right, under Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. And its manipulations of Afghan events long precede 1974. So this is something that Pakistan considers to be a part of its enduring national security interests. And um, just as the United States walked out on Afghanistan and handed Afghan policy over to the Pakistanis in 1990, that's exactly what's happening here. But this time the stakes are higher. You know, um, Afghanistan is one of the youngest countries in the world. For the last 20 years, Afghan young men and women grew up expecting a different kind of future. And they are going to be sorrowly disappointed. And I think the, the thing that's really different from the 1990s is that so many Afghans worked with the United States. So many Afghans risked their lives uh, working on military bases, working as translators. And the U.S. hasn't even been responsible enough to make sure that those people can get out of Afghanistan with their family. Uh, so this is in so many ways even worse than the 1990s, in my view. Okay. All right, okay. So um, this week, Taliban also uh, met Chinese from, uh, foreign minister, and we have seen a number of uh, statements about Afghanistan coming from Chinese leadership recently. So what role do you think China can play in stabilizing uh, Afghan efforts while keeping in mind Pakistan's uh, possible influence? and uh, kind of friendship with India, with China? So China doesn't care about Afghanistan, right? China doesn't care who is in government. China doesn't care if Afghanistan is democratic or whether it's an Islamic emirate, right? China doesn't care. What China cares is that Afghanistan is adequately stable, that it can exploit Afghanistan, right? It, it is the it's the largest investor in Afghanistan, and it hasn't been able to take advantage of those investments, like for example the Anak um, copper mine, because of instability. So it, it's only natural that the Chinese would agree to work with the Taliban to bring stability on the Taliban's terms. Like I don't think people remember that even prior to 9/11 the Chinese and the Taliban had an agreement, right? As long as the ETA doesn't attack uh, targets in China, the Chinese had no problem with the Taliban. I mean, they had signed a memorandum of agreement in essence, and the Chinese were also about to sign an agreement with Osama bin Laden saying the same thing. And so if you actually go back and, for example, you listen to some of Osama bin Laden's oldest, denouncements of Muslim oppression throughout the world, he never once spoke about China, even though China's repression of not just Uyghur Muslims, but all Muslims certainly happened during that time. So from the Chinese point of view, if they can work with the Taliban to bring stability so that China can extract and exploit Afghanistan's resources, that's great. Right, because the Taliban, uh, they want power, right? They don't want to govern Afghanistan. They want to rule Afghanistan. And this means that instead of giving political parties or political leaders kickbacks for these deals, the Taliban will benefit, right? In the same way that they've benefited from um, being able to traffic in poppy and other, and other, you know, smuggling activities like wood and, gems and and so forth so 
that's that's where I see China. They don't care what happens to Afghans. They just want stability so that they can exploit Afghanistan. That's the Chinese business model everywhere. Okay, um, at the end, uh, Christine, if you tell me that uh, why the U.S. Uh, couldn't defeat fully uh, Taliban or they couldn't eliminate Taliban in these 20 years, what reasons you see behind this? So, I mean, I think the, the first and foremost reason is that there's there's two reasons. One, if you look at contemporary insurgencies that have been defeated, like let's look, for example, at the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka or the Khalistan insurgency in India or Chechnya, right, uh, in Russia, those insurgencies were defeated with massive depopulation, massive human rights violations, right? Essentially what the, the Sri Lankans did in uh, the Tamil areas is that they essentially genocided Tamils. The six were, uh, you know, essentially in problematic villages, men of any military age uh, who were sick were simply targeted for elimination. And, and the Russians used a combination of uh, brutal elimination along with political co-optation. So these, these are countries that um, don't have terribly robust human rights records. Look at what the Pakistanis are doing to Pashtuns, for example. So these are countries that, that don't care if they engage in massive human rights abuses. But the United States, um, though our military has certainly done many things wrong um, and our military personnel have done terrible things, they are in isolation, right? So to defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan would have required massive depopulation of Taliban areas of young men. And the, there's, that's just not going to happen. Um, after the American experience with Vietnam, where the Americans were in fact accused of that, including uh, mass murder in Cambodia, this is not something that's going to happen again. So that's that's one issue. The second issue is that um, you know there's a lot of literature on on, on insurgencies. The, the insurgencies that are really hard to defeat are those that have sanctuary in another country. Right. So and the United States, because of its relationship with Pakistan, could not pursue Taliban leadership. Uh, I mean, why is it, you know, why weren't we targeting the Quetta Shura with drones? Why weren't we doing this? Um, why, why is it that we haven't just sent assassins into Doha and killed the Taliban leadership? Right. I mean, it, the U.S. could do so many things, but it, it's chosen not to. But the things that it has chosen not to are the things that uh, would be needed to defeat the Taliban. And some of those things are just patently illegal under international law. And some of those things the United States has made, uh, has tied itself into knots over. Um, and I'm specifically talking about Pakistan. I think I see on your bookshelf as well, Carlotta Gall's uh, Wrong Enemy. You know, Carlotta Gall and I, I mean, we are we are in complete agreement We've been fighting this conflict in the wrong country, right? The enemy in Afghanistan is just a puppet. The, the puppet masters are in Rawalpindi. Thank you so much once again, uh, Christine Fair, for your time. Thank, really thank you. Tashakur Khanum. Khada Hafez. Tashakur Khada Hafez. So I'll, I'll share the link with you. Uh, okay. We'll send it, yeah. So this interview is going on here um, next week. And the okay. last question that why the Taliban could not be eliminated fully, we will use this in, a, in our special package. So I'll share okay. that link with you, right? Okay, okay. All right. thank you so thank much. You. Have thank a great, you. Have a great weekend. You, you, too. you too, thank Bye. you. Thanks, bye.